is this making me happy? It's not. And it's not because it's a bad job. It's not because it's a bad industry, but I just knew it wasn't what I was meant to be doing. And for me, that was really, really frustrating that I was like trying to fulfill something that like my shoe just couldn't fit. I'm naturally quite an ambitious person. So for me to not feel the drive to be ambitious was a bit worrying because it was like, what's happening to me? Like, I'm usually quite ambitious. Why don't I feel driven to like progress in this career the way that I feel like I should? And so it was just a lot of indications that no, it's not that this is a bad place. It's not that it was a toxic environment. It's just that it just wasn't where I was meant to be. One thing that I noticed when I was doing my research is that you use the word obsessed a lot, right? <laughs> <laughs> like Jamelia was obsessed and the word obsessed, it has different connotations towards it. Like mm -hmm. it shows someone who's like over the top, a bit out there, a bit extravagant. Whereas for you, you're very like reserved, I'd mm -hmm. say. What made you call yourself Jamelia is obsessed? Like where did that come from? Um, I think it's, it comes from the fact that if I, if something piques my interest, I go really deep in it and it's really hard for me to get distracted. Mm. And I think I'm quite a focused person. Like if I have my eyes set on something, I'm quite good at having tunnel vision. And so I was like, oh, let me just call myself Jamila Obsessed on Instagram because it's yeah. like an easy name, but it does summarize the fact that like, I'm obsessed with beauty. Mm. Like that's something that I'm definitely obsessed with. I'm obsessed with watching documentaries. And sometimes my obsessions have like l larger windows, like beauty, I've always been in love with beauty and always been obsessed with it. But last year I randomly became obsessed with Korea. <laughs> and I was watching all of these documentaries. That window's gone now, I'm not as obsessed as I was. Mm. But occasionally I just, yeah, sometimes things just pique my interest and it's like, if it does, I can't just know things at a surface level. I always want to dig a bit deeper. Mm. And so it does become a little bit like an obsession, but a healthy obsession. Nice one, nice one. So when, when you say dig a little bit, little bit deeper, is it trying to understand like why something is the way it is? Honestly, understanding yeah. why is like, I spend so much time doing it and I've had to train myself to not do that so much because sometimes you don't need to know the why mm. or sometimes you're not going to understand the why because it's not consistent with the way that you think. And so in those scenarios, I'm getting a little bit used to just taking things at face value and not trying to understand the why of everything, especially when it comes to humans, because trying to understand the why of humans can <laughs> lead you down a rabbit hole. Tell me a bit more about that. Yeah. Um, I just feel like if ever something happens, like for example, if something dramatic happens and quite traumatic happens in say the news, my first thought is like, why did that person do that? Like, what were they going through? Who are they? What was their upbringing? Like, that's how my mind works. Like, I mm. just really want to get to like the root, like what caused this to happen? And time doesn't allow me to do that for everything, first of all. <laughs> and two, I have to be really selective with what I pay attention to. And I was even listening to a podcast yesterday and the guy was saying that something really traumatic happened to him as a child. And when he saw the person later on in life, they like hugged him and greeted him like nothing had ever happened. And he said he was looking into the person's eyes, expecting to see a little bit of guilt and there was nothing. Like mm -hmm. the person was genuinely happy to see them. So sometimes I've just accepted that humans are really, really complex yeah. and you can't always understand the why. And maybe my brain's not wired in the same way that their, theirs is. So maybe I won't ever understand their why. Mm. So I'm trying to do better with being a little bit more selective <laughs> about what I dive deep in and just practice discernment. Yeah, I like that. Because um, even when you're talking about people, you can't really explain people. And mm. I think about logic. Like, I, I used to see things through a logical lens. Oh like, gosh, if you too. do this, this means that. But yeah. I started to realise that sometimes it doesn't make sense. Do you know what oh. I mean? Like sometimes you have to go against what logic tells you because you yes. might get results that you don't expect. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Or you can just keep, sometimes I've realized that as humans, we can be, we can observe the same situation, be in the same situation and have two completely different experiences. Yeah. And that, when the ball finally dropped, that blew my mind. Cause I was like, we were both in the situation together. Like we both, observe the same thing, mm. but your account of what happened and my account of what happened are completely different. Mm. And at that point I was like, okay, this is interesting. I can find out the why from my perspective, but trying to understand the why from their perspective is gonna be really challenging and something that I might not be able to do. Yeah, yeah. And maybe for a reason. Yeah, so you said you've been obsessed about beauty. So where yes. does that why come from? 
I don't know. I've just always loved hair. Like, even when I was in nursery, I would get in trouble because I wouldn't be paying attention. I'd be, like, playing in someone's hair. Yeah. And then as a child, I used to play in my mum's hair a lot to the point that she cut her hair and she was like, it's because you just <laughs> wouldn't leave my hair alone. <laughs> and I was like, okay. And then as I grew a little bit older, I started getting really obsessed with products because I was like, okay, I know that products are good for hair. So I'd literally spend time in the bathroom just reading the labels of products. Like, oh, I wonder what's in this product or I wonder what the directions are. I wonder what the instructions are. And yeah, I just really became curious. And Mm. then that progressed to me gaining an understanding of beauty standards. So I was like, okay, if I really love hair, I really love products. Like, what does society tell us is beautiful? And what do you have to look like in order to be accepted as beautiful in society? So that really um, piqued my interest as well. And it kind of just evolved from there. Yeah. So with that in mind, how did you end up in banking? Because when I saw like your evolution, like in terms mm. of you wanted to do like performing arts, um, wanted to be a lawyer, um, you went to do PR like in, mm. in New York, but then you ended up in banking as like your first proper like um, arrived job. Yeah. Like, how did that come about then? Because I used all my savings in New York. <laughs> <laughs> so before I went to New York, I went to Beijing for the month. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then we were in New York for like just under a year. And then I got back to the UK. Both of my internships were unpaid. So while mm. everyone was getting paid on placement, <laughs> I was getting nothing. I was literally relying on maintenance grant and my savings from mm. my retail job. So I got back and I was like, I have no money. Like yeah. before I go into final year, I need to earn some money. And so, was a website called Milk Round? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 yeah I went yeah, on Milk yeah. Round and I saw the role and I was like, listen, I don't, I don't even know what asset management is, <laughs> but the pay's good. And if I revise for the interview like I revise for my exams, then I'm sure I can get the job. Yeah. So then I revised for the interview like I, re- like I would have revised for an exam and got the job. And then, yeah, spent a lot of time trying to figure out what asset management was. But <laughs> <laughs> I was able to like secure the internship they extended my internship and then they gave me the grad position I see, so I it see. wasn't like a desire to be in banking mm-hmm. the reality was it was a higher paying profession and i had burnt through my money doing what i was enjoying mm. and i just needed to replenish my bank account whilst you were there did you ever like try and convince yourself that, that i liked this, it that you liked oh it? absolutely yeah. yeah um in my internship i gave it my all like yeah. i showed up as my full self full enthusiasm, made the most of it. Same with internship. Even year one, I was like, of the grad scheme, I was given it all that I had. Mm-hmm. Year two, I was given it all that I had, but I just couldn't like get rid of this idea for Treasure Tress. And so I was trying to like focus on career, but I just couldn't seem to let the idea go. Mm. And equally, I was looking at the women that were really high up in the workplace. And I was like, I really respect them because they're really intelligent and like they're really well respected professionally, but I couldn't see, then life just didn't look dynamic to me. Mm. And that's something that I really, really seek. Like I need to enjoy my life. It needs to feel full. I need to travel. I need to have good relationships. I need to have kids. Like I actually desire that. And I didn't really see that reflected. So I was like, "Mm, I don't think I'm climbing the right ladder because that destination is not where I'm trying to get to. Yeah. And at that point I started to think, okay, cool. Maybe I should like just start getting the wheels in motion for this idea and see where that takes us to. Mm-hmm. What did that look like in terms of the wheels moving? Um, I started researching brands. So like trying to compile a list of brand email addresses. Bearing in mind I had no contacts and no experience. So didn't even know what to Google. Didn't know that there were databases that I could have paid for. So I started compiling that list and then I started doing research on the subscription model. Like how does it work? What platforms do you use? What tech do you use? And then I started Eventually I set up the Instagram page and my idea for that was just to post inspirational pictures of black women, mixed race women with curly, kinky, coily hair. Um, Primarily because I wanted to retrain my mind Mm. on what I defined as beautiful. Because when I was in my teens, I defined beautiful as straight hair. When I was in uni, like before I went to New York, I defined beautiful as straight hair. Like I would literally not go out without my hair being straightened. And so I wanted to retrain my mind on what my definition of beauty was. And so I started posting images of these women and like building somewhat of a community on Instagram, which was like 300 people. And then thankfully Palmer's, the brand reached out and was like, hey, this looks great. When's the box launching? We want to be a part of it. And I was like, oh, this is insane. Like I wouldn't <laughs> even know how to approach them, but mm-hmm. they found me, which is great. And then that really gave me the momentum that I needed to like get the box out ASAP, knowing that I had the support of a brand like Palmer's. Because up until that point, did you already, like what was the idea? Was the idea like um, 
a testing box? Like, what was the idea? So the idea mean? was a box that gives you everything that you need to wash your hair. So it was always going to be like products and hair tools. Yeah. And the interesting thing is I thought that I was building that box for children. So my intention was to target mums with daughters so that their daughters would have a box to play with. And then as women started completing the landing page, which was linked in our Instagram bio, uh, there was a form on there. And when I asked who's the box for, me or mini-me, it wasn't skewed towards mini-me, it was more skewed towards me. Mm -hmm. And I realised, oh, wow, these women are buying the box for themselves. It's not actually for their daughters. And so initially when I launched Treasure Tress, it was three boxes, mini-me, tween and queen. Queen being like the oldest one, mini-me being the um, kids. And then over time, we transitioned out the younger two boxes and then just had the one box because ultimately, if it's a vegan brand or a clean brand, you can use it on any age group. It doesn't need yeah. to be specific to that box. That's what I was going to ask, like how different, would, how different would the products actually be? So at first, there was a list of kids' brands, but we yeah. burnt through those quite quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and then we started introducing like vegan brands or like just brands with clean ingredients. And I was like, this is literally the same thing across the boxes. Mm. There's no point me packaging it as something different. And so we transitioned out the other two and kept the main treasure trust. Well, renamed the queen box, just the treasure trust box. Got it, got it. So take me back to Palmer. So Palmer's reached out to you, yeah? Yeah. Um, <laughs> did you know they were coming? Like, what was that like? How did you know it was them? What was the conversation like? It was did crazy. Yeah. They, I think they sent a DM asking for my email and then they emailed and... Yeah, it had the legit signature, it had a number, everything. And from there, we were able to have a phone call. Mm -hmm. And when we had the phone call, I feel like I realized, oh, this is real. And then I feel like I even went to their office once the box was out to have a meeting. And I was like, this is absolutely crazy. First of all, I didn't even know that they had an office in this country. <laughs> Same. Second of all, I wasn't aware that they were getting into the hair care market. Mm. And third, I was just really impressed with like the enthusiasm of the lady who reached out and her understanding of what impacts we were trying to make in the market. Yeah. So it was very surreal, but I also feel like for me, it was validation that keep going, yeah. or like this is gonna work, or you're, you're following the right thing, you're doing the right thing, you're following the right path. Because up until then, I was calling brands, cold calling brands, like literally going into conference rooms on my break and saying like, hi, my name's Shamili and I'm starting this company called Treasure Trust and we're doing boxes. And at the time, no one was doing boxes. So mm. they were like, okay, like, because was the original pitch like give us full size products or give us sample products? Um, I was going to take anything. Yeah. <laughs> I wanted full size products, yeah. but I got pushed back on that quite um, early on. So then I started saying, like, okay, and sample. But because they had never heard of subscription boxes and they were just used to like regular product on shelf retail, yeah. it wasn't something that appealed to them. They have no, I was no one to them. So they were like, who are you? <laughs> um, third of all, a lot of the brands were US based with no reps in the UK. So they were like, We've, we're serving America, the UK's not a priority. Mm. And so, yeah, there was just a lot of stumbling blocks. So when Palmer's came through, it was like, oh, finally, yeah. <laughs> like some validation. And then I think the interesting thing about partnerships is once you've got one big name, Everyone wants then him. it's easier. But before we had Palmer's, it was like, yeah, it was a very humbling experience, man. <laughs> Cold calling is not for the faint hearted. It's, it's not, but to have the resilience to keep on going though, like, because you can always give yourself an excuse, especially in this day and age where everything is online. Yes. You tell yourself, oh, I don't need to cold call. I can just do cold emails. But like the amount of spam emails that Literally. I get every day is And mad. I just didn't want to wait. Yeah. I, I, like for me, time was really of the essence because I set the date that I wanted to quit. And mm. so for me, it was like by that date, the business needs to be up and running properly. So how long did you give yourself? I feel like I gave myself like a year, mm. but it ended up being like a year and a half because before I quit, I made the mistake of telling everyone that I was going to quit, mm. including my mum. Um, my mum's my biggest cheerleader, but she's a teacher by trade. Yeah. And she, her mum was a teacher as well. So I come from a lineage of like education. Everyone thought I was going to be a teacher for that reason. Like education is key, but equally stability is key. Yeah. So you've got a finance job, as a teacher, it takes you years to earn what you earn in finance. Mm -hmm. So she was like, why would you throw that away? Like, surely you can just do like your little business on the weekends and do your job full time. And then I'm sure you know how it goes. I started um, picking up the house phone and there would be an auntie on the other side of the phone. Like, <laughs> Jamelia, I heard that you're thinking of quitting your job. Yeah. So literally everywhere I was going, people were telling me like, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it in various different ways. And then the only other person on the other end of the spectrum was my dad. She was like laid back Jamaican man, like, 
just do whatever makes you happy. And that is just one thing that I just kept in my head. Like, okay, is this making me happy? It's not. And it's not because it's a bad job. It's not because it's a bad industry, but I just knew it wasn't what I was meant to be doing. Mm. And for me, that was really, really frustrating that I was like trying to fulfill something that like my food, my shoe just couldn't fit. Yeah. And equally, I saw like my peers as grads, like putting themselves forward for, for promotions, like doing all of this overtime. And I was just like, I'm naturally quite an ambitious person. So for me to not feel the drive to be ambitious was a bit worrying because it was like, what's happening to me? Like, mm -hmm. I'm usually quite ambitious. Why don't I feel driven to like progress in this career the way that I feel like I should? And so it was just a lot of indications that, no, it's not that this is a bad place. It's not that it was a toxic environment. It's just that it just wasn't where I was meant to be. Yeah, yeah. So was that extra six months enough time for you to save enough money or was it like just dealing with the conversations? I think home? it was more like, emotional for me like yeah. trying to just accepting the fact that I'm gonna have to make a decision that is displeasing to my family mm. but it's pleasing to me yeah and I think it was just working through the guilt because my mum first generation in this country my grandma came over during the wind rush and when she got to the UK she was stripped of all her qualifications and had to train as a teacher from scratch so in my mind I'm thinking oh my god like the women in my family have worked so hard to get to where I've gotten to I started to think like, am I just being like a spoiled brat and being really selfish and just thinking about myself in wanting to quit and just pursue this like entrepreneurial journey that no one's really done before. And so I was like going back and forth in my mind, like, am I, am I like the guilt was taken over? Am I being stupid? Am I being naive? And then there was another part of me that was like, I'm so young that if this is a mistake, I can make a U-turn. Yeah. Like this isn't it, like it's replaceable. Like yeah. what I had is replaceable. And I was really keen on make, maintaining a healthy relationship with my workplace, even on my exit, knowing that if it didn't go well, I'd want to do a U-turn and rejoin the company. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there was, there was just a lot of conversation. So the six months, or I think it was like between six and eight months, that was literally just me working through the conversations. And ultimately, now that I look back, it was like me trying to listen to my intuition and get mm. rid of the noise, mm. because there was a lot of noise around like other people's expectations, other people's projections, fear, which was ultimately what everyone was sharing. And it's not because they were bad people or like they were being horrible. It's literally just because they they valued safety and what yeah. I had was safety and they just didn't want me to undervalue it. Then it got to the point where I was like burnt out. Like I remember one day I was going to leave the house and I couldn't find my keys to open the front door and I literally just burst out in tears. And I was like, this is really pathetic. <laughs> like, it's actually not that deep. But I realized it wasn't, it was like the frustration of the situation. In addition to the fact that I was exhausted because I was trying to do both. I was literally getting to work for 7 a.m., 7.30, leaving at 7 p.m., working on Treasure Trust till like two, waking up at five and doing that like every single day. Yeah. I was like, this isn't sustainable. So once that, that moment in particular, I was like, okay, this is enough now. Like I have to just choose myself and whatever happens, happens. I'll just take the consequences. Yeah. What was day one like? Of quitting? Yeah. Oh God, it was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like everyone's got this dream that like day one, you're going to go and have these meetings in the coffee shop. <laughs> oh my God. I remember sitting there with a calendar in front of me of the rest of the year and I was like, what do I do? Mm -hmm. Like there's so much to do that I don't even know what to do next. And then I just had to think, okay, it's a monthly box, which means there's a monthly deadline. Let me work backwards from that day of the month and try to figure out how I fill this box every single month. Yeah. And so I started doing that. But the day one, it was terrifying because mm. it felt like there was so much time in the day. Yeah. And before I was struggling to find the time. Yeah. And now it was like, there's so much time, but I don't even know what to do with it. And I started to think, oh, did I do this prematurely? But equally, I felt like, no, because my body physically couldn't, couldn't have continued mm -hmm. mentally couldn't have continued and emotionally I was just not managing <laughs> so I was like it was the right decision and I'm gonna have to figure it out but right now this is terrifying because I'm used to structure literally you go to reception nurse well nursery reception yeah. school secondary school university job you've got so much structure and then all of a sudden there's none yeah so the first day was tough but I think the hardest day was when payday rolled around and I didn't get paid <laughs> And I was like, oh, wow, like, yeah. it's really up to me to make sure that I get paid. Mm -hmm. This is wild. Did that give you more of a push, though, to like, say, like, Absolutely. Okay, yeah. Absolutely. Because, but then you also realise that no matter how much you save, it's never enough. Money, we need money in Honestly, this life. <laughs> I was 
just like, okay, I'm saving, but I saved, yeah. but it's not enough. Like I have, to, this has to work. Mm. And that was literally, there was no other thought. It was like, this idea has to work. There's yeah. no other choice. You mentioned a lot about like your intuition and mm. then your intuition driving you throughout that whole conversation and even driving you in the sense that, okay, Palmer's are on it. Let me just keep drilling down in this idea. So were there any other times when, like how, how did you develop such a strong kind of sense of listening to yourself? Or trust in your gut? I don't know. I feel like a lot of the times I'm forced into it. Mm. I often joke that I think that God must think, oh my God, this girl is so stubborn because I'll have like an inkling about something. I won't listen. And then something will happen and it will be like, yeah, this is what I was trying to push you to. Mm. So even with Aston, I wasn't meant to study business and international relations. I was meant to study law because I really wanted to do law. But I'd done the IB and I was short two points for law. And so my mum was like, do you want to go to a different union and do law? And I was like, absolutely not. Like, I've got my eyes set on this university. I absolutely want to go there. Like, something's telling me that. I, I guess there it is as well. Like, mm. there was something telling me that I should be at Aston. Equally, in that gap year, something was telling me to go to New York. I don't know why, but I was just like, I just couldn't get New York out of my mind. Mm. Um, so then... I obviously thought my life was over when I realised I wasn't going to be a lawyer. <laughs> um, and that meltdown made me feel like, okay, maybe this is a redirection for a reason. So I think it's often when I hit a brick wall and things don't work out the way that I expect it, that's when I learn how to trust my intuition and think, okay, this is actually directing me somewhere else or this is a confirmation that I'm doing things the right way. Mm. But for me, sometimes it can genuinely feel like a physical feeling in my stomach. Yeah, yeah. And is it like when you, every time you listen to it, it just kind of confirms that, okay, yeah. this is the feeling that I need to go with. And then when I don't, I have a meltdown. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm left with no choice but to actually listen to it. Yeah. yeah well, I should have been listening to it all along. How does it go with like some of the partners that you might work with because mm. with um so obviously you have your subscription box yeah and there was a time when you had to struggle to get people in the box yeah. but now you probably have to turn a lot of people you have to say a lot tell people no yeah for them to get into the box how do you discern like the right partners to work with versus the wrong ones do you know what it is for me it's like do you actually care about the customer that we're serving is the main qualifier for me yeah even if i've got this phrase that i was telling my friend the other day i was like you have to learn I was, we were talking about some business thing and I was like, you have to learn how to separate the art from the artist. Like you're not going to like every business person that you meet. Mm. Like personally, you're not, you're not going to want to be friends with every person that you meet. But if they're good at business, they're good at business and yeah. there's no two ways about it. But when it comes to like brand partners, I might not like the person as an individual, but if they genuinely care about the customer that we're serving and their product actually solves a problem in the market, then for me, it's a yes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I like that separating the art from the artist. Mm. Um, I'm talking about, talking about entrepreneurs because you've done a lot of traveling. I think you, were, did you go to Necker Island? And see yeah, Richard Branson? at the beginning of this year, which feels like a lifetime ago. What was that like? Insane, like yeah. mind blowing, surreal, unreal. It literally felt like I was walking in paradise. <laughs> Honestly, like you could walk around barefoot for yeah. pools, jacuzzis, hot tubs, random animals just walking around. Mm. It was it was insane. Did you take up did you pick up any particular lessons from that trip? Yeah. Some people live life very differently. <laughs> <laughs> that was the main one. Um I was actually in awe the whole time. Primarily because yeah, I did learn quite a few things actually from Richard, because he was on the island and he would just like be walking around the island. Mm. And his daily routine was like he prioritized fun in a way that I'd never seen. So he wakes really? up at six and goes straight to the tennis court. And then from there, he goes and does some water sports. And then he, I don't know what he does, probably goes back to his house and does like something. But he's generally like always surrounding himself with new people. So when people come to the island, provided he's not booked elsewhere, he actually comes and immerse himself with groups of new people. Interesting. Because he's committed to like learning people and like learning new things and exploring new culture. Like, I just learned how much he loves learning and how that curiosity and desire to learn can really help you build a fulfilling life. Mm. And then for the other people that were on the island, like the founder of Farmville was there, you know, that game. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah like there were some mad people, like the guy who created Tetris was on the island. There were some mad people on the island. Mm. And from them, I learned that they figured out the wealth game really quickly, but like the personal game, they hadn't had it, they didn't have it figured out. Mm. So a lot of them had like, had all the financial success, but they were missing like relationships, mm. friendships. And it was crazy. Cause to me that that's the easy stuff. It's like <laughs> the wealth thing that I'm trying to crack. But for, for them, it was a completely other way around. Yeah. 
Um, I learned how freely money flows. <laughs> <laughs> like that definitely taught me that. Mm-hmm. There was one guy who, uh, there was a second day you had to like stand up, introduce yourself, say what you have to offer the group and request something in return. And he shared a story about his mum and how she, I think he was, I think he was Jewish. His mum marched with Martin Luther King and she died recently, but on her deathbed, she felt like all of the work that she had done throughout her life was undone because they were contesting abortions for women. And she was like, how can we not allow women to have the rights over their bodies? And he said that he formed a charity off the back of that. And he said, like, if anyone's willing to um, like donate to the charity, let me know. He left the island with $350,000. The next person went up and was like, yeah, I love that. I'm going to give you 25K. Wow. The next person walked up like, hey, I'm going to give you 10K. When we left the island in the group chat, he said, thanks, guys. I've raised 350 k wow. in like three days. I was like, okay, is this how easy it is to get money? Because... Yeah. This is different. I like this. Mm. And even that, the story that it tells me is being ready to have an uh, have a have something that you want to ask for. Yeah, and being ready to you ask. You be ready. It. Yeah. Because for me, it was like, and I think also it made me challenge that. Like, why do I not feel like I have any? My, my mentor was on the island, and he was mm. like, Jamelia, like, what do you want? Know that when you come to this island, you belong to be there. Mm. So I know you're going to be in awe of people, but also remember that you yourself are also remarkable. And I was like, okay. <laughs> And then I didn't. I wasn't prepared for the like need and ask thing, or like what you can provide and what what you can offer and what you can ask for. And so even that exercise was really uncomfortable because I'm not used to saying like, "Hey guys, this is what I have to offer in this room." Yeah. You kind of just expect your reputation to do that for you based on the industry that you're in. So yeah. like, if I was going to a beauty event exploring diverse beauty, I would expect people to have a good understanding of like why I would be of value because mm-hmm. I've literally built a business to serve the diverse consumer. Whereas with this group, I was like. I don't really know what the offer is. Yeah. I don't really know what, well, I know what the ask is, um, but the offer was really uncomfortable. So that made me realize like, get more comfortable, like asking for things directly yeah. because that man literally went up there and said, who wants to give me money? And mm-hmm. he left with money. Um, but equally understanding like the value that I possess based on my experience. Yeah, because sometimes it's easy to discount that so, like, so much. So easy. And I think using the example where you said someone's built a game, done a game, someone's doing some other stuff, whereas mm-hmm. you're coming from an industry that they're not familiar with, mm-hmm. and you never know what they might be dealing with back home. And Absolutely. they actually need to say, have someone to speak to about the culture. Absolutely. Um, yeah, that finding that value in yourself and making sure that it's evident all the time is such a key thing. Yeah, um, and knowing how to communicate it. Exactly. But you, I will find you quite a good communicator in a sense oh, wow, of your... So your Instagram, mm, yeah? I like writing. You like writing. Mm. Who are you writing to on your Instagram? It feels like you're writing to a younger self. I'm writing to myself so that I can scroll through and think, oh, okay, when this happened, this is where I was. Mm-hmm. When this, And sometimes I do. I spend a lot of time on my own Instagram page, <laughs> like looking back and like, oh, wow, yeah, I forgot that that actually happened. Mm. Do you know what? I'm actually proud of myself for that. And I think sometimes I even look at it from the lens of my younger self and think, wow, I would actually think that I'm quite cool. Yeah. Like younger Jamelia would actually be really happy that, I didn't stay in asset management and I actually didn't ignore that like burning desire to explore beauty yeah. because that's that's what I love. Mm. Did something like kind of spur you to start writing like those long messages on Instagram? No, my mum, as I mentioned, my mum was a teach. my mum, she's part retired now. Mm-hmm. Um, so she's a part-time lecturer, part-time retired. But when we were younger, I grew up in a single household. It was me, my older brother and my mum. And my mum was very big on like travel, adventure, exploration. She was not buying us clothes. She was not buying us new shoes. We were going on holiday and we were having a new experience. And because of that, she used to spend a lot of time tutoring kids. So she would come home from work and then she would tutor kids. So she's like, give us dinner. And then I was pretty much left to my own devices. So in that time, I used to like write books and like staple them together or like, I was just always doing something creative and writing was always a big part of it. Mm -hmm. And I remember one of my, at one point in my life, we moved to Atlanta for a year. And my teacher in Atlanta said to my mum, oh, she's going to be an author. And I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> but like, she could just see that I loved writing. And so it was kind of, like, I, I don't know how, I do, I think I've tried like a short caption like one or, once or twice. It and it just work. doesn't feel authentic to me. It feels like I'm trying to do like, you know, one of them song lyrics. Like, yeah. It's cringy, <laughs> like, it looks good for other people, but it's just not me. Yeah. And I would rather actually like, provide value to someone else through what I'm saying, or at least document my feelings accurately so that when the time comes, I can look back and say, oh, okay, that's what I thought at that moment. Oh, okay, that's the context for that picture or that video or that situation. But do you feel that you're always able to be that honest in your captions or do you have like a diary or journal? I have a journal. Okay. Um, 
I have a journal. I'm not crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where the, girl, the real thoughts go. Yeah, that's the real, real. <laughs> the Instagram is the considered what my therapist would say. Yeah. Rational Jamelia processed it and then it goes. But mm-hmm. my, yeah, my journal's the real, real. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. I'm thinking about that. Like, um, I was going through a journey of using a journal for about nearly a year. Mm-hmm. Like, it's weird. Like, I go through a six month stint where I'm mm-hmm. doing excellent with it. Then I stop. Same. Then I start again. Then Same. I stop. Same. Um, especially this app called Day One, which I think is so cool oh. because it will give you a notification of what you wrote on this day last year. Oh, I'm going yeah. to check that out. And you can add photos to it. Like, it really, sometimes when I look at it, I just start laughing because um, I started it when I quit my job. Mm. Um, but not exactly in 2019. I started a few months later. But I wish I started it at the beginning. Yeah. Because, oof, yeah. <sighs> some of the, some of those thoughts, like, when I go back and I look at some of the thoughts I had, I was like, rah, I just want to give myself a hug. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's other times when... I just lack the energy of which I'm writing at mm-hmm. um, because you can just feel it. And Andy A.M., I remember he always has this kind of philosophy of looking backwards and making sure you spend the time to review your performance. Yeah. Otherwise, you don't know where Absolutely. you're going. You're just being quite aimless. Um, but it's just that discipline. Mm-hmm. Like how do you ingrain that discipline of being reflective, being on point, being a visionary, like focusing on your philosophy, which mm. I find quite difficult. Yeah, It's tough. I think the consistency with journalism... It, it it's tough, mm. but I try not to put myself pressure. I just try not to put myself under pressure to do it every single day. Yeah. To be honest, I tend to journal when I want to like either rant <laughs> or I want to like celebrate something. Mm. <laughs> Very rarely do I do the in between, but equally I know the value of it because I've got journals from as far as I can remember. Yeah. And again, sometimes you look back and you think, oh, bless you, man. <laughs> like you were really trying or like you were really going through it. Yeah. But as Andy said, like without that hindsight, you don't, you can't appreciate how far you've come. Yeah. And a lot of the time, I think if we leave it to the world, we'll only quantify our progress monetarily yeah. or materialistically. But when you can look back at like your journals and consider the personal development, I think that's when you realize, oh, wow, like I'm winning mm. in the person that I've become based on where I started. Yeah. Because yeah, hopefully we're all like trying to just be a better human. Yeah, I love that. And in terms of personal development for yourself, like Mm -hmm. where's your North Star? Like what have you been trying to work on? Intuition. More? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah. I feel like as I've gotten older, I don't feel like it's as strong as it was. Why is that? I think it's a lot to do with like expectations of society. Mm, And... Go on also younger me so when I was in I think while I was at uni I'd done like a five-year plan this is when I thought I was going to be a lawyer yeah and the five years was like qualify get on the like training contract train, training contract basically have all of the steps to be a lawyer mm-hmm. then year five it was like have a family <laughs> literally <laughs> by that time I would have been like 26 yeah <laughs> and I was like that's I thought that's what I wanted then but I wouldn't have wanted to be a mum at 26 that's yeah. the reality of it and so I'm constantly like going back and forth between, okay, what would one younger Jamelia want versus like, what does this Jamelia actually want? And I'm also doing an exercise of like, do I really want this? Or am I just telling myself I want this because this is what everyone else is doing? Mm. And I went through the same thing when we was at uni and everyone was doing placements. As much as I knew I wanted to be in New York, I did still apply for placements in the UK because everyone else was. And I was like, well, everyone else is doing it, so I must be doing it. And as much as peer pressure doesn't seem as great when you get older, as a woman, especially like when you know that you want to have kids, there yeah. is also pressure of like, okay, like, do I trade this for this? Or like, mm. what pace should I move at? And so for me, it's been just like making sure that my life looks the way that feels true to me, mm-hmm. as opposed to living my life the way that I think society tells us to live it. And making sure that the things that I desire, I actually desire. Yeah. And I don't just desire because other people desire it. How do you check in with yourself then? Meditation. I've been up in my prayer game massively. Um, Travel really helps me with that. Like the time on the aeroplane, even just being in a completely new environment, it does make me like, I don't know, it kind of just like centers me Mm -hmm. and makes me feel very alive and just opens me up to the opportunity of life. Because as much as I love London, congestion is real. Yeah. And even mentally, like I, I do feel very congested when I'm here. Mm-hmm. And equally, 
I think there's hyper visibility about everything and it's so easy to get distracted. Mm. Whereas when I'm in a completely different location, I don't know what's going on in London. Yeah. I know where I am and I know where my feet are planted and I can think about, okay, cool. So like, when do I want to make this next step in life? When do I want to enter that phase of life? Do I want to enter that phase of life? What do I want it to look like? Where do I want to live? And I start asking those questions. Whereas when I'm here, it's like, okay, next email. Yeah. next post next interview next like there's always something mm -hmm. whereas if i'm in a different location then i can like mentally disconnect and like reconnect with myself yeah it sounds like you're being more intentional with your decisions as well yeah. like really planning like yeah yeah because i find that i'm trying to think of a time when i haven't been intentional anytime i try to be unintentional things just don't really work out for me <laughs> like when i try to just follow things they just never work out for me yeah you don't like going with the floor I, I like going with the flow, but I'm not allowed to. <laughs> like, I feel like God genuinely shuts it down. And it's like, yeah. this is not what you're doing. I'm sorry. I'm not approving that. So no, that's genuinely what happens in my life. I'm not even joking. I like that. I like that. I like that. So um, I've got a couple of questions before we yeah. um, say goodbye. So first question is, give me a tool or a tip that helps you with your productivity. Writing things down. Mm -hmm. Pen to paper. My most productive seasons are when I literally plan my day hour by hour. Mm -hmm. So wake up, know exactly what I'm doing from the time that I wake up to the time I go to bed. Because then it doesn't leave time for like idleness. There's no time for scrolling. There's no time for like foolishness. You've just got to get done what you need to get done. Mm -hmm. so I would say pen to paper and planning your day hour by hour. So I'm going to ask the same question, but this time for creativity. Oh, for creativity, new environment. Remove yourself from your day to day. Yeah. Completely new environment. One, no, no technology. Okay. One piece of advice that you wish you never listened to. Uh, one piece of advice that I wish I never listened to. I don't really listen. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't really, honestly. I, okay. One piece of advice that um, you hear a lot, but you just don't think it's right when people say it. This is going to sound very interesting. <laughs> so one piece of advice, I think as women that we're taught is that like we shouldn't pursue things. We should wait for things to pursue us. Mm -hmm. And I wish that at a younger age, I learned that, no, you absolutely just go after every single thing that you want in life. You don't wait for it to come to you. And I randomly thought of it the other day <laughs> because my niece was telling me that I actually heard myself say it the other day. And I thought, oh not me passing on advice that I wouldn't even listen to myself but she said something and I said no 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 no. it's meant to be the other way around and when I said it I thought Jamila what have you just taught her that's actually not what you believe mm. like you actually believe that you just go out and get it like you don't wait for it to come to you I love that I love that um final question one actually I've got two more actually three more <laughs> <laughs> um, one piece of advice that you always like to give to people hmm. pay attention to your passions because I think a lot of the time we just like dismiss it. Like it can be a hobby, but I just need to do this other thing. But I think it's really important. I don't feel like we're giving gifts and passions for the sake of it. Mm -hmm. I feel like everything is done with intention. And I think like out of respect, I think we kind of have to honor that. Awesome. A book that you'd recommend? First one that comes to mind is Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill. That's the book that I read before I quit. And it basically talks about the concept of fear and how it's ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And it made me, it really helped me with the processing of like, I'm not going to die if I quit this job. So that's that's how I rationalise most decisions. Like, am I going to die if this doesn't happen? Or if I do this? No. Okay, cool. Then I'm going to do it. Amazing. And where can people find you? On Instagram at Jamelia is obsessed. <laughs> <laughs> and on TikTok at Jamelia is obsessed. And at Treasure Trust as well. Amazing, Jamelia. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>